Welcome to episode 17 of season 2 of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Friday the 6th of November 2009 and in this episode we are going to talk about whether Karmic has been a car crash, we'll cover the latest news and events and we'll have an interview with Anna Nilsson. Then we'll do a competition, ecosphere and feedback. I'm Davey and with this week are Tony. Hello. First, Hello Tony. Firstly, who are you? You know, was this? What are you, who are you? Why have you wandered into our studio? <laughs> oh, what do you stranger. mean? Uh, do you mean I've been a stranger? Yeah, I, I yeah. jest, of course, listeners. It's Dave. But <laughs> it's nice to have you back with us. Well, <laughs> and congratulations. Yeah, congratulations to you and your missus. Oh yes, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I sadly, oh, you you had um, Odd Camp. Obviously, mm. it was the last episode. Yeah, and I was quite gutted to have missed that. Yeah, I was. Uh, I, I was otherwise indisposed. I was. Uh, I became a father for the second time, and it happened on the on the Saturday, which was the day before, and yeah. it made it sort of a bit of an inconvenient to go. Well, <laughs> we have got to talk to you about your priorities. I know, um, and I know. clearly you're you're not doing a good enough job. Well, <laughs> the thing is, I w- it, it was crossing my mind whilst I was having my fingers broken with mm. with all the huffing and puffing of you know of, of what goes on. Um, I, I I was thinking to myself. If she can hurry up, yeah. then I can probably still go. Yeah. But then I thought, wow, well, I might get in quite a lot of trouble if I do that. Particularly so. if they give her lots of gas and air. She might not notice you've gone. Oh, she hogged the gas and air the whole time. She would not share it. <laughs> oh. Anyway, you did a very funny uh, blog post about your new um, baby. Oh, my new long-term As a, L- your LTS new long-term release. Sport release. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so is that blog.davy.com? Yes, yes. It's, yeah. uh, it's now the second blog post on there. Okay. But yeah, yeah, it was... Uh, yeah, I wrote it up as a as a release talking, and I wrote it on behalf of the release manager because obviously oh, she was a bit tired. A bit to, tired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. I mean, feel free to to check that out and leave comments and such. I but quite yes. like the compatibility with the first release. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I had to. Sh- I mean, uh, see, it was a bit tricky with that because um, it did cross my mind to write. Well, you know, I had to make it clear that the first one was not superseded. It was uh, it was ju- it was just another release because obviously when you have a second child you have to think about the first one thinking mm. you know they're not being replaced. It's the whole Ubuntu Kubuntu thing, isn't it? Really, you know, we don't prefer one over the other. But well, clearly we do. Oh, well, but yeah, I can't yeah. admit that. I mean, you know, m- <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, m- m- myself and Junior are already talking about going fishing and doing other fatherly son things. Oh, of course, because your first your first baby was a girl and this one's a boy, so presumably yeah. you're going to be you know taking him out to chop down trees and things. Gross. Yeah, and you know, manly going stuff. down the bar and other very manly manly stuff. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, we did, we did miss you, but obviously, you know, you had a, a kind of semi-legitimate excuse not to be there. <laughs> I should explain also, if you can hear in the background, we haven't moved to um, uh, Basra or somewhere like that. It's uh, fireworks night here in the UK, and so there's lots of fireworks going off outside, which may sound a little bit like gunfire. And and for those that aren't in the UK, what our fireworks night is, is it's is it's basically celebrating of our Houses of Parliament not getting blown up. Yeah. Um, and with the current politics, I, I think people <laughs> would actually celebrating it if they wish it was blown up. The other way around. Perhaps, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. But. Yes. So that's what that's what you can hear in the background. It adds a little bit of flavour and, and excitement <laughs> and danger. Um, so what have you been doing other than having a baby for Ubuntu? <laughs> um, or have I'm, you had not much time? <laughs> well, I, I haven't had as much time as I wanted. Um, I mean, there, there's a few, I mean, already uh, Lucid is, is being opened up, mm. uh, which is obviously the next release. And, uh, and I have already actually upgraded the machine to Lucid. Um, and it's, it's <laughs> I mean, just a sort of be, be a bit of a test drive to run it from scratch. I mean, clearly, I mean, it's, it's pretty much still very karmic and and yeah. you know, th- there's no real changes there. And I'm expecting it to break. But it's a spare machine, and I thought I'd run it from the, the total start of the release. Because yeah. th- this week, the actual archives did open for Lucid um, for people to upload stuff. Um, so, I mean, I um, we already had the first server meeting. Uh, one of the things that I've been tasked with this week is try and speak to the Spam Assassin up, upstream. Oh, right. Because they haven't released for like a year and a half or so. And touring the idea of running a sort of a trunk snapshot for Mm. for Lucid. Just talking the idea, I've sent them an email to see whether they'll be happy with that and really, um, or or whether they have a release sort of planned in this Ubuntu time frame of the next sort of five five months or so. Uh, So that's one thing. I mean, at home, uh, I've been, uh, I've upgraded, uh, I'm I'm running Myth TV under Karmic now. Mm -hmm. Uh, I added um, satellite for that, uh, FreeSat. Mm. Yeah, so we're getting... Uh, I mean, that's the only way to really get HD channels in the UK at the moment is to run it over satellite. Um, 
also what? set up uh, Squid and, uh, and, and Dan, Dan's Guardian. Oh, the filtering proxy. Yes, which... <laughs> Is this to protect your two-week-old baby from well, the evils of the internet? I know, I know. I mean, they're, 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 there's people out there, you know. Or but... your missus. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, also as a... Uh, so, so not just that, but also a way of basically speeding up my, uh, my, my internet connection as well, so mm. I can... Um, cache a lot of the things I go to because I, I do go to quite a lot of the same sites quite regularly and although the browser does cache I do use multiple machines so it makes sense to sort of cache it on the on the local network but ad- additionally um, I, I've also added something called banner filter and what you can use that is is actually take out adverts before they even get to your machine so for example I've removed like AdSense and things like that right. and it's amazing a lot of web pages that actually have adverts in they look so much cleaner when you strip them out Wow. You know, as in they actually look mm. like use the whole screen rather than having sort of mm. banners down each side. It, it just takes it out. So when you go to a, then a network where you're not using that, it's a bit of a surprise to, to come across that. Is that, is that all? I, th- I think they'll do for now. Uh, okay, I do right. For- I did wonder whether you were yeah. going to tell us everything you've done ever since uh, well, the last couple of shows that you've not been in. So. Quite a while. Yeah. 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 But anyway, Tony, what, what have you been doing? Uh, I've upgraded a load of systems. I had a load of things that were still running Intrepid, and now that Og Camp and um, Lug Radio Live are out of the way, I upgraded them all to firstly Jaunty, and then most of them onto Karmic already. Of course, you you can't just do it straight through. You have to leapfrog through each release, don't you? Yeah, that's the advised way of doing it. I didn't didn't bother to try and do it any other way, so I gave it a go. And other than um, a couple of software raid problems, uh, it was all fairly seamless, which is quite good. Was that um, MDAD raid or was that... Uh, yeah, software raid. It just yeah. didn't start the arrays on, on a couple of kernels, tweaked a bit. Ah, yes, and you put po- like, exactly the same thing. Yeah. O- on a fresh install, well, it was a fresh install I migrated to be raid right. afterwards, and I had, the, I had the same bit. I had to rebuild the um, the init RAM thing, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I had it on two different systems, so it's obviously a, a bit... Of, well, there is a bug file about yeah. it on Launchpad, so it's known about. Yeah. What about you, Laura? Um, I've installed Karmic. Mm-hmm. on an empty machine and it went smoothly excellent and yeah i just i installed that and then i installed some of the um software that we need at work which is nicely being put together by um anton mm-hmm. um and it just installed and whereas like you can run a windows installer for hours yeah <laughs> this was on in about half an hour plus the packages as best part of an hour if that and it was just so nice <laughs> excellent <laughs> but that's not for me yeah, and uh, Alan and um, Simon are, are watching fireworks tonight. I hope so. I believe not, yeah. not with each other. No, and and they're not sat outside the studio <laughs> either, with their wellies on and their sparklers. If, and if their... you listen very carefully, you might hear the ooh. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, let's get on with it. Sounds like a fun pack show. Ubuntu Karmic has not long been out only in the last couple of weeks, but it's already caused some headlines. There, were quite, there was quite a good bit of good press when it was first released, and it's now started to generate some rather more negative headlines. Yeah, I mean, the good stuff is is it was demonstrated on BBC. Yes, that's it? right, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and yeah, so, I mean, it was... A, and the, uh, Graphically, there's been a, quite a lot of changes, like the boot-up sequence and things like that. But some people have actually, like, had not so good experiences. Mm. Um, some of the things people have quoted is, like, sound issues and... Um, you the know, issues with the NVIDIA driver playing back movies looking all blue, sort yes. of there was a blue haze over them or something. Yeah, but not be- blue movies, blue, <laughs> blue picture and, and, and MP expenses and yeah, and um, but you um, but I mean I, I know that on Hardy I believe I was running an ATI graphics card using a proprietary driver. I got mm. a blue tint on that. So it, so things like that aren't anything new. They're also not going away by the look of it. No, but. Um, one of the th- unusual things for me about this is that, in fact, it's reached some of the more mainstream IT press, like the Register, which does get read by an awful lot of people who work in the IT industry. And the Register is traditionally Linux's friend, really. Yeah, I mean, generally, yeah. They, they, they tend to slant towards good favour stuff yes. in Linux and be more critical of proprietary software. Yeah. And, and, and the, but the headline they've got here is, Early adopters bloodied by Ubuntu's Karmic Koala. Ubuntu 9.10 is causing outrage and frustration with early adopters wishing they'd stuck with previous versions of the Linux distro. Yeah, Ouch. which is quite hard hitting, really. Mm. And I, I do wonder quite how many sources they actually got that from. Probably only, well, maybe only a handful, but it only takes a handful and they've verified yeah. it and they've but, written an article about it. But I mean, it. if you uh, have any product, you're going to have 
bad examples of that. And I don't just mean the software. You know, um, for every for every hundred sort of people that buy a model of car, there's gonna be a few people that find things they really don't like about them. And people tend to be more vocal about stuff which doesn't work well. I mean, I I mean, I, I've been running Comet for quite a while now before it's released, and uh, running my I mean, running the machines that's now on a stable. I can't really report any any major killer problems on on the desktop. I haven't blogged about the fact I've had a good experience, but people do tend to be more vocal when they have a bad experience. Yeah, that's it. You 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 please one person and they might tell one other person. You annoy what somebody and they tell twenty other people. Yeah, yeah. But uh, some of the issues now I know Windows has problematic upgrades, but some of the issues that we've seen in terms of Ubuntu upgrades. We, you, you and I both had a similar issue when we've been doing upgrades recently using with software RAID, and we've both had to well, fix it. Well, no, to problem. be fair, mine wasn't an upgrade. Mine was a fresh install. Oh, okay. Mine was actually creating a single disk to, right. it, to a, but it was the same issue. We both had essentially the same issue, and I had it on two different machines. So we've, we've all had this issue, and you and I have system administrator-type people who can go away and fix these things. Now, maybe less technically minded users wouldn't be using software raid and stuff but you know those problems would have stumped them they'd have stumped you know my parents if they'd happened to see that message on the screen and i wonder whether the expectation that every upgrade will just work flawlessly is unreasonable given the complexity of a modern linux distribution i think if um i mean there is the argument that people who aren't sort of technical or geeky or whatever wouldn't be doing the actual installation themselves like on a fresh machine they'd have it installed for them but the update manager makes it really really easy to upgrade because you just it alerts you when there's a new version released and you press the button yeah i mean something tony touched on a few minutes ago he said about you know windows there, there, there is a, sometimes a problem upgrading but the thing is windows doesn't release every six months and also, they're not so yeah. pinned to a, to a release date. Although, um, I think in Ubuntu's history, it has only missed one release plan release, and that was Dapper. That was Dapper, yeah. Yeah. Um, but so, although it's only missed one, it is kind of quite a strict date, and there has to be something quite major to block the release. Now, with Windows, they are they are always slipping on on their their intended dates, uh, from from my experience at least. I I mean, it does raise the issue: is releasing every six months too often and also what what is a release for every six months well should we be looking at those six, six monthly release as a experimental well it's you know as long as it's not a long-term support it's funny you say that because um for for, for this release cycle um a, mo- uh, a lot of my work has been uh, aimed at the actual server version and we, we have a discussion mm. in one of our in our meeting um a month or so ago and i raised the issue saying mm, actually you know because I'm saying there was someone said, "Oh, we shouldn't target this for this release." And I thought, well, you know, really, this is a proper release, you know. So I said, mm. should we really be considering sort of a non-stable release? And actually, uh, at, the, at the time, it was the um, it was the actual server manager, I believe. Uh, he actually come back and said, "Well, yes, that's what it is." And someone else said, "It's a technology preview. A non-LTS right. server release is a technology preview," which shocked me a little bit, really, because I never really considered it like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I. LTSs are every two years, aren't they? Yes. Which I think is way too far apart for to wait for a stable release. Well, I'd happily... I mean, I at the moment at work, I'm using Intrepid, and I only moved to that about three months into Intrepid's lifetime. Um, but I'd quite happily go with a 12-monthly cycle and skip, you know, not bother upgrading in between. But I wouldn't want to wait two years because that's ages and everything. Firefox is out of date and everything everybody else has moved up to, I can't move up to. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, um, I mean, if we look how Debian does it, they, they release when it's ready. And we're having those six months really puts you under pressure to make sure it's out the door because uh, it's very easy for dates to slip and things like that. And Debian doesn't have a release date as such. People estimate but I mean, De- Debian works differently. Rather than having a sort of six months development cycle, there, there's the uh, sort of three versions, isn't there? There, there? There's unstable testing and stable, yeah. and packages cascade through the versions until stable is stable, and then and then it's shipped. Yeah. Um, so I mean, in some ways, that actually makes quite a lot of sense to do it in that sort of schema, doesn't it? Um, but I mean, I know some people actually run testing as a matter of course. You know, th- that is their stable machine. Mm. It's a, it's a compromise. They get slightly newer versions of the, of the packages, but it's not totally unstable. Yeah, I mean, people call... I mean, well, I'm not saying it's fair or not, but some people do actually call Debian stable, Debian stale, because quite often so it can be quite old. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
But I, that's what I mean about the LTS. I, that's why I wouldn't want to stay on it. Now, if you sort of installing for an office where it's totally non-technical people and they just use whatever they're given, then fine. But I want to be able to use a stable enough desktop that I can do my work on it. But I need it to be fairly up to date. And also upgrading every six months is actually quite a chore. Because Which is why al- I don't do it. Al- although it's quite straightforward, as you point, rightly pointed out, um, you, you might expect there to be some headaches, which you, I don't know whether it's right yeah. or wrong, but you know, it is time you have to set aside to actually do that. And particularly if you're on a slow internet connection yeah. as well, uh, because from the uh, live CD that people get from ship it or, or buy that, you can't, you can't actually upgrade from the live CD, can you? No. You, you have to use the alternate yeah. CD, yeah. which is downloadable only. So, you know, it's, if you've got a slow internet connection, you, you're in a bit of a bad position, really. As someone, Davy, who's been involved with the developing side of releases, what um, do you find in terms of the six monthly release that it's good in terms of encouraging people to keep on top of the bug fixing and getting a good quality release every six months so that it doesn't just degenerate over the 12 months? Or is it such an overhead to have to do that every six months that it actually doesn't benefit? Well, I mean, I, I can really answer that in sort of two ways. Uh, one of the things I was working on is, is Asterix. And the, 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 sort of about two weeks or so before release, uh, there was there was still things I really wanted to try and squeeze out. Like I wanted to change the way it starts. Um, for example, uh, this release, a lot of things moved to Upstart, which is a way of, of launching applications, particularly sort of demons and servers and things. Um, but I, I wasn't really getting a reliable one that was... That was I didn't really have time to test it, so I did get very frustrated towards the end. And I was thinking, you know, I'd really like an extra month on this. You know, it's it's so tight, so stressful. I, I I found for that. But another point you actually raised about sort of losing focus on previous releases, and yes, that that has happened. Um, one of the other things I've worked at is, is the Myth TV area, and um, I I know that some bugs we've actually marked as won't fix that are on still supported releases. Uh, but the development focus uh, has moved forward. Um, and it, you feel bad doing that. But the trouble is, is it's limited resources and you, you, you can't, you, there's not enough manpower to do everything. How long are previous releases maintained for? Well, non LTS ones are 18 months. Okay. So, you know, you're actually um, exponentially, you know, creating quite, a, quite yeah. a workload. And also, then you have to have test environments and quite often a virtualized one isn't quite enough, uh, particularly when you're doing stuff with hardware, like for, with, with Myth TV, you're caring about tuners and things like that. So, you know, having a virtualization isn't necessarily enough. So you need to stay current with each one. And particularly when the actual upstream application is is changed quite significantly, it can, it can be quite a headache, really, I think. So, you know, although the six months thing really does pack a punch with putting so much work into a tight area, you sort of feel oh, towards the end of it, you just think, oh, man, I just really, you know, frustration and wanting a break because you really feel that you really want to get this done. But it's just the, the lack of time. Whereas if it was similar to the sort of way the Debian works, you think, well, you know, I've still got a bit of time because we're not in, you know, because they, they have quite a long time between releases. Yeah, but they don't have the rhythm, I guess, of... Well, that, that's what it is. Yeah. It's, the, it's the motivation. I mean, uh, in, a, in a previous job, I worked at somewhere where um, under new management, um, what they did is they said, oh, people are waiting for this new application. We've got to get this out the door. We, this is the date. It's got to go out. And so we were, and I, I was still at the office going towards midnight. And and, and so we, we got it out on the date and uh, and we thought, oh, you know, the, the, we felt, felt real satisf- you know, really satisfied that we managed to get it to the date and we'd be pleasing all the customers that were, that were waiting for these new features. And in the first month, we had about three downloads. And when uh, and it sort of, what it was, it was a management style of basically keeping the pressure there to, to get the task done. Mm. Uh, but when you realise actually if the, the, there wasn't really that need there, it, it felt quite disappointing actually. And it, I think for the following release, that, sort of left its mark i think in many of the developers that work on that project uh yeah well, the other aspect is that initially in like the early releases of ubuntu there was a lot happening in each release and you could look from one release to the next in six months and see the massive differences and now there doesn't seem to be that much difference and possibly because there's a lot more underlying stability stuff being done and things and that takes up the time which is fine but again it kind of makes me 
not especially inclined to upgrade unless there's some specific thing that needs fixing. Yeah, so um, one of the things that really went into this one is 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 the new way it boots up. So we've got Grub2 as installed by default, mm-hmm. um, and we've also got um, the way uh, applications spawn at the same time, whereas traditionally you would start one, then the next, then the next, then the next. Uh, in many ways, a lot of them are being thrown, saying, okay, just start all these together. So your computer works really hard to boot up, but in long term it should reduce the actual boot time um so i mean as you say that's when the underlying things uh but also the actual boot sequence is actually a lot prettier now you know is in we've got that's the true, yeah. yeah so i mean there are some features there the um i mean some people have been quite critical of the artwork in this release haven't they the, the, they're always critical of well the artwork. yeah yeah i mean the, the actual desktop background didn't didn't bowl me over to be honest um i mean the actual login screen um, I found to be a, you know, much prettier in the actual theme there, but the but the default desktop background possibly could have been a bit prettier. I, I don't I don't know. I don't. Know. I'm not entirely sure this is in any way irrelevant to what we're trying to talk about, which is whether the release cycle is um, is is too much, and whether people have the unreasonable expectations in terms of of the stability or the usability of, of new Ubuntu releases. I mean, it's, it's new features that are coming to Karmic, sure, um, but. You know, John O'Boken wrote a, wrote a blog post saying that you know the, the criticism that this new release has had is, is, is a symptom of its success and is actually Ubuntu because it's getting, being used by more and more people. When you do a release, you suddenly get unprecedented numbers of people trying it out and um, finding bugs that the test people haven't, you know, that the testers haven't yet found. Should more people be trying the early release, the, the betas or whatever? Well, yeah, I mean, I entirely agree. I mean, um, someone said in a, in a previous episode that it's actually a duty of Ubuntu user to actually do testing, which I'm not sure I really agree with. No, yeah. me neither. Um, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily, although I did actually have my parents running Karmic before it was released, I wasn't expecting them to report bugs. Um, I was expecting them to use it as normal users. And then if they have a problem, they tell me and then I investigate right. and report it if necessary. Um, and they did that involuntary, to be honest. They weren't aware they were running a development version. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so the perhaps, that, that, yeah, perhaps that was a little bit unfair. I don't know. But um, I mean, something um, I think I think might be yourself that said that um, if you don't, I mean, if a bug gets reported like a day or two after release, well, if someone's capable of reporting a bug that soon after release, then they really that they could have been testing because yeah. I, I think every free software project often suffers from not enough testing because to be honest, that's not the sexy part. No, the sexy part is developing. And I don't think people are all that excited about doing testing. And it's really the developers that do the testing, which is, you know, if you look at it as mm. a proprietary development way, that's really quite dirty. There's, yeah. I mean, although there, there is a Ubuntu QA team, um, I, th- I think they are quite overworked. Yeah, and, and they can't test every single combination of hardware and things that's out there in the real world. Well, yeah, I mean, th- th- that's something that Mac really benefits from, yeah. is the fact they've got uh, they've got a platform designed from scratch, and they know exactly what's going to work on there. So, so their QA is, is possibly a lot easier. I mean, you, you, a, a Ubuntu computer could be anything from, you know, a, a computer that's 10 years old to, to a su- yeah. supercomputer, which is unfair. Matt, uh, Matt B90 on Twitter touched on this, actually, and he said that, Maybe it is hard for any operating system to be tested on all environments and experiences will vary. Um, this is maybe something that where OSS can take a lead but because you've got that wider range of users um, potentially reporting bugs and things. So, so Something actually you mentioned earlier about it being very easy to upgrade. One of the hidden features of uh, do release upgrade, which is the command line um, uh, application for actually doing the update, which mm. I think we took, touched on before we mentioned it before yeah yeah um that's actually got a feature that not it isn't very well documented that allows you to actually do a, a sort of experiment upgrade uh, okay yeah. where basically what it does is it, is it do, does it as an overlay to the to the current one so what you can do is you can just delete that and then you've got your normal one back and i'm not saying this is a good way to, to actually test as such but i think it is it, it's an interesting concept to basically allow people to easily test drive on the upgrade and also running it under th- their own local environment. I mean, something I've traditionally done is if it's a work, if it's a, if it's a computer I depend upon, uh, but I still want to test it on there is I might dual boot the current stable one mm. and the development one. And then if I boot up and the development ones won't boot or there, there's a temporary issue, I can just reboot. And then at the boot selection screen, I can boot the other one sharing the same home partition, which is, 
a bit controversial because if you're running an application that automatically updates your configuration files, you yeah. could be left stuffed. But, but it's generally all right. But, but in, I've been doing that for, for probably about three years now, and I've never really experienced a problem with that. Mm. Um, so I, I think that pe- more, more people could and should. And it, you know, to actually get the latest buzz of seeing the features as they appear it, it is quite an interesting concept. And you know, I, it would be really good to have more people testing, I think. Yeah, again, touching on that kind of thing, uh, Charles Yarnold on uh, Dintica. No, I, I read that as Charles Y. Arnold at first. But. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Charles Y. Arnold. Or Charles Arnold, whichever. <laughs> Charles. <laughs> Let us know. Um, if you, he says, if you can't expect to have minimal problems with upgrading, it shouldn't be as easy to initiate, which is kind of what I was saying before. Yeah. That said, he's had few problems. Um, but touching on what Davey was just saying, maybe it's more a case of... Um, better managing the upgrade experience from the Ubuntu perspective. So it gives you the, it will do this sort of test upgrade. And yeah. when you're happy with it, you say, yes, I'm happy. Move on or roll it back. That's kind something. of helpful. But most of the problems that I've experienced, which again have been fa- fairly few and far between, have been things that only show up at the reboot time. There have been kernel issues yeah. or, or disk issues, you know. Um, but I, I'm probably, as, well, I am as gu- more guilty perhaps than some people. Is that I rarely run the development version um i've only just recently upgraded my intrepid machine to jaunty and then then to karmic and it but i'm not sure you should feel guilty for that because if there wasn't if everybody was supposed to be running the development version you wouldn't bother to do stable releases yeah yeah Yeah. whether long-term support or not i mean i hope i haven't misconveyed myself and saying that everyone should i'm just saying that if you're capable and you've got the time and 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 the motivation to then then it's not basically closed mm. to a select few of people. Oh, it no. is open because I mean, everyone when release day happens, the, the, you know, basically the internet goes crazy of people saying, "Is it out yet? Is it out yet?" Well, you know, yes, it's officially out, but you could have been running it a week ago. You know, well, look, be- before we started the show tonight, we were discussing it briefly and we were saying about the idea that people install it after release day and then start raising loads and loads of bugs. And there's an argument of why weren't they doing this before release day. But I think one of the aspects is that until you start using it properly, you don't necessarily hit the bugs that you want to rip, that you will then subsequently raise um, on Launchpad. And if that work machine, if that machine is something you rely on, you don't want to be running a development environment on it. So... Uh, and also because you're reporting these things on Launchpad and anybody can see them and subscribe to them and, and hear all the chatter about these bugs, unlike a closed development environment, such as a you know, Microsoft Windows 7 or whatever, it might seem that there's more going wrong than actually there is in comparison with mm. a, a, another operating system. It's just that you don't have access to their support ticketing, ticketing system in, in Microsoft's terms. And just the very fact that you know, this release of Ubuntu is being actively compared with Windows 7 now, okay, they released around the, the same time as each other, so that it does help. But you know, it, it, a Linux it's distribution is being compared really. <laughs> being compared in the mainstream media with the biggest dominant operating system in the market. That's fantastic progress. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Um, There's some, something um, the, the, the last social network uh, person um, c- came up with. Yep. Uh, where they saying it shouldn't be so easy to upgrade. Well, uh, I mean. If, if we look at the concept again of you know perhaps people should be using LTSs if they really depend on their computer, uh, an LTS release, although the upgrade path is to go to the next release, um, e- either the next direct release or the next LTS, okay. the, the, the LTS release will only prompt for you to upgrade to the next LTS release. So you actually have to do some tomfoolery for it to... No, so, for example... Oh, upgrade, it's the intermediate one. Yeah, yeah. So if we go to Hardy to... Uh, the non-LTS release of Intrepid, um, you actually have to uh, you have to, you have to do some tomfoolery for that to actually happen. It doesn't come up with a little notification window saying there is an upgrade available to a new one, whereas it does do that on on, on non-LTS ones, and it does do that from LTS to LTS one. Mm. So you know, I, I, you know, it's, things are starting to point towards. Well, if you really depend on your computer, perhaps you should be using an LTS. I mean, that's what an LTS there is for. Yeah, I mean, people using Windows XP have been using it for seven, eight years with very little change in, in, in terms of new features. They've been able to add extra applications and stuff. Yeah, sure, I, but, think, you know. I think you can, because, I mean, uh, you can run, say, Firefox 
three point five yeah. on Windows XP. True. Whereas you're, you know, on Ubuntu, I'm sure you can hack it, but it, the easiest way Backboards. is just to stick what you've got. But in some ways, actually, that's a downside of, of the whole Linux distribution model is that you need you don't need to upgrade a load of other stuff, but generally you upgrade a load of other stuff in order to get the latest version of, say, OpenOffice or Firefox. Um, whereas perhaps you're quite happy with you know the version of Minds that's included. I suppose we should um, just conclude. Alan's not here today, but he did blog about this as well um, uh, yesterday, no, a couple of days ago. Um, and one of the things he concludes is, you know, you don't have to upgrade. This The, the uh, version of Jaunty is still um, is supported for another year or whatever it will be. You know, there's no, there's no... In fact, there's multiple supported releases, including long-term support releases. Um, don't feel you have to do it. On the whole, they do work, but there's a great community and a great support structure you know, if you do have issues, go. You know, make use of them. Make use of Launchpad or the IRC channels or the forums or whatever it is. Um, and I think we've. It's fair to say that we've had quite a few people commenting on this this evening on Twitter and Identica. But generally, the the, the comments have been. You know, I might have had a small issue or something, but basically, it's worked. It's fairly positive in our unscientific sample. Yeah, a terribly unscientific sample of listeners, but you know, they seem to have had good experiences. And, and maybe there are just a few few people who've been frustrated who are having um, you know, who are quite vocal about it. But yeah, send us your views into the usual address podcast at ubuntu-uk.org or any of the other methods. Microsoft have released a roadmap for the release of document in the PST file, the data store for Outlook accounts. The documentation will be released under their interoperability standards and may help open source projects extract data from existing Outlook data so- stores as part of migration to a new email client. Yeah, this is quite interesting because one of the few things that we don't know how to poke and interrogate is a .pst file, but yet they're everywhere. Well, um, they're, they're, I mean, I'm a bit of a noob to this area. But I understand there are a lot of projects that have proprietary connectors for this sort of stuff. Mm. What well, one that comes to mind is the Zimbra. Um, you can get Zimbra for free yeah. um, under open source, but they're open source license. Uh, however, if you want to use your Outlook with it and get all the bells and whistles with Outlook, you have to pay extra. Now, I'm not sure this is the same thing, but it might make it a lot easier to have an open source um, yeah. interaction with Outlook. And Evolution used to have to screen scrape Outlook web access. Oh, that's lovely. Originally, which is, a, I mean, I guess it's the only way they could have done it, but it's a horrible hack. And there's a potential here that they could actually interrogate these files directly and get all the data out. And Evolution could become a an Outlook front end, sort of. Yeah. I mean, Outlook already, I mean, Evol- Evolution and Outlook, they are pretty similar <laughs> already, aren't they? Yeah, that's true. Skype will soon to be a bit less evil than it used to be, as an open source version of their VoIP client has been announced. However, it looks like it's only the user interface which is being released, but this should at least make integration between Skype and the Linux desktop environments better. Yeah, see, this is quite interesting, because um, in order for some of my voiceover IP stuff, uh, I actually run the Skype client in a fake X session and actually connect via their API to their current client. So if you, if you basically still get the proprietary libraries, but you can connect to it, using right. your own code, then that is quite exciting. Um, I, I actually only learned this week that Copeat, which is the... Um, the KD- KDE messenger yeah, thing. Yeah, right. equivalent like Pigeon or Empathy or something. That already actually has some support for this. I haven't tried it myself, but that's something I learned this week. It's just a shame it's only the UI stuff and not the library stuff. But, but still, still, it'd be nice to see it sort of integrated with the, the, the menu and the away status and things that, you know, is all part of the GNOME desktop that we've seen over the last couple of releases. Yeah, yeah, because, I mean, also, um, the the QT look of, of the Skype client always looked a bit foreign on a Linux desktop, I always mm. thought. So do you, does this mean that we can or we can't use it for the podcast, if it's sort of <laughs> half open source? Well, we are sort of using it already for our voicemail. Uh, <gasps> well, you, but, uh, but people people can use it, but they don't have to use it. Yes, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, but I mean, like, for like recordings iTunes. and things. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, probably, <laughs> probably not. With, 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 with Studio A's bandwidth, I'm not sure we could get away with having <laughs> us. And also, when we were both sat, ne- sat next to each other on the same chair, it <laughs> I was thinking more if you got stuck in the deepest, darkest depths oh. of the sticks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> otherwise known as home. <laughs> <laughs> A new group has been founded for all those interested in promoting Linux and floss to the unaware. The group is called the Linux Dairy Council. 
presumably a reference to lactose pimping quangos. Yeah, it's all about promoting Linux to people who have never heard of it and, and to get the word out in the same way that the milk marketing board used to put slogans and posters in, in schools and things like that. In case you hadn't heard of milk. In case you didn't drink enough milk and your oh. teeth fell out. Linux Dairy Council, who are they? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yahoo have done it, the source code for their traffic server, a high performance application server for builders of cloud services to the Apache Software Foundation through their incubator project. Yahoo hopes to build a community around the project, improving it for everyone else as well as themselves. Dave, you know about clouds. Is this exciting? Well, we'll have to wait and see, to be honest, because uh, I haven't really heard about the traffic server stuff, to be honest. Uh, it's quite new to me, so I'm going to wait to see what basically they, they, they drop, and I would like to read up on that a bit more. A lot of people have said that it's just a good way for Yahoo to keep maintaining their product but now that they've not got as many developers as they used to have. Well, I mean, there are a lot of applications and, and companies that do do that. When it's stuff they don't really want to maintain in-house anymore, they throw it out to the community and basically get people work on it for free, so everyone wins. Yeah, it's all more code, isn't it? It's all good. And, and Yahoo are quite helpful to the to this free software. I mean, we always get, like Radio Live, we always get the uh, the Yahoo developer key rings, don't we? I haven't had those for a couple of years, but yes, <laughs> they were very useful. Every year. We've got some events coming up, and the next one is the Ubuntu Developer Summit. Uh, in Dallas, Texas, on the 16th to the 20th of November. So that's only next week or week after. Dave, you're going, aren't you? Yes, I am. I fly out next Friday. Have yes. you got a big hat ready to wear, a big 10-gallon hat? <laughs> Have you booked a hotel room? Uh, th- uh, yes, I'm actually sharing with um, Ugusto, the... Um, I hope I pronounced that correctly. He's, he's the Wooby guy. The Wooby guy. Ah. Yes. yes. Yeah, I'm actually sharing... I'm, he's my Wooby. Oh, he's a really nice he's guy. He's your Wooby. He's your Wooby. <laughs> my Wooby. <laughs> I got that <laughs> Well, you'll have to uh, report back for us, because uh, I think we're not... Well, we're definitely not we're going. Not so. going yeah. I mean, you might actually be recording whilst me and Alan Pope are still there. Yes. So we, you could potentially give us a call and, you know, we could give you a quick insight about yeah, what's like, going on. Maybe like, we could yeah. use Skype. It. No, uh, I can't. Oh. There's the Scottish Open Source Awards on the November the 20th. At the prestigious Forum Building in, at Edinburgh University. And there's FOSDEM on the 6th to the 7th of February in 2010 at the University Libre Br- Brussels. Or Brussels still. <laughs> uh, we still not fix that. <laughs> no, <Nope. laughs> you can find out more at fosdem.org. You guys going? Uh, um, hopefully, yeah. haven't really looked at it yet, but time is ticking on now. Yeah, it's not so to... far away. It's only mm. a couple of months. And that's just Laura Kachowski said that. Um, oh, she's going. She's got she's, her. She's hotel got a hotel booked. booked. Yeah, I, I was actually talking today about actually booking the, the actual Eurostar to get there. Last year, I had everything booked, but. Thanks to 18 inches of snow, I couldn't really get on my house. So I was quite <laughs> gutted about that. All in the first hurdle, really. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, if I had a 4x4, four four, I'd probably been okay, but there we go. We're here on the landing outside the toilets and the pub after Oz Bar Camp with Anna Nelson, who gave a talk this afternoon about automating documentation. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, so... What is your profession? Why are you interested in automating documentation? Well, I, um, my, I'm, my degree, my PhD is actually in economics. Um, I got into computational economics, and that was sort of a slippery slope into programming. Um, and I got into uh, automating documentation when I was writing my thesis and decided that you know manually typing numbers out of a statistical analysis into a, a LaTeX document wasn't really such a great idea, especially when you had to rerun your simulation and the numbers all changed. So I started, um, I suppose I got interested in it you know, quite a while ago when I was doing that and then after um, after I finished and started working in industry and finance um, I started realizing that well you know this issue of running calculations or doing any sort of work and then having to update a document that depends on something like that um, you know is a fairly fairly common issue that arises in a lot of different venues so um, I mean today I was talking about a specific application which was um, working with software documentation but I suppose that the area is more, you know, has more a broad interest. So you're talking about things that um, could essentially be automated, but hadn't historically been. Uh, well, I think they've been automated historically in some ad hoc situations, but in general, um, documentation, um, w- with a few exceptions, hasn't been hasn't been automated, or at least not to the extent that it could be. Um, and it hasn't been automated in a way that fits in nicely with people's workflows and makes it a natural process to to, to document. 
I mean, I, I'm rather aware of using, um, you know, creating documentation for applications but based on the source code, doing that automated. Um, but some of the things you touched on in your talk were actually creating things which aren't related to, to programming. Um, so, so the actual tools you use, what are they? And were they actually designed for using things which aren't related to programming? Uh, well, I suppose, I suppose yes and no. I mean, the, the, one of the, the, the tool I use that kind of knits everything together is a fantastic tool called Webby, which um, it's a Ruby gem, and it was written, its, its stated purpose is to generate static websites. Um, it's actually a fantastic tool for generating any kind of static content. Uh, so you set up, t you set up layouts, um, which is just sort of any sort of, uh, you know, any sort of... Uh, layout and sort of like in terms of a HTML sort of layout. Okay. Um, uh, a template or something. A temp yeah, a template. Um, and then you'll, you'll write pages that can use whatever template you want and you can put any sort of dynamic content you want within that template. So the original intent was to use this as a, you know, for websites, for generating websites with, you have all your CSS and your navigation built into the layout. Um, but it's actually, it's a, it's a tool that's built well enough that it can, that it can be applied to any number of scenarios. And so I find it works fantastically well um, for writing very complicated LaTeX documents where you can use all this layout and templating to, to generate LaTeX or any kind of text file you want. Um, so for me, it's, um, it's worked out very well for doing software documentation, but also for doing any kind of document where you have a template that has to incorporate information that's likely to change or where you want to build in um, the results of running some other script or running some other some other computation. So is this something that is currently in use by projects or something that you'd like to see up further uptake of? Uh, it's something I use in a number of projects myself. Um, like I've built a few of the tools myself. I've ported a few of the tools into Ruby from other languages. Um, it's not quite a ready-to-go coherent package at the moment. I hope it will be within a couple of months because it is something I use myself in production quite regularly. I know plenty of other tools use, um, well obviously Webby is in very, very broad use in terms as a blogging tool and as, you know, as a, as a, so, um, a website generation tool for a number of websites use Webby. A number of projects use Webby. Um, so I, it's some of the components, um, but in general, the whole suite isn't, as far as I know, in broad use at the moment, but I hope it will be soon. I thought so it was really interesting because uh, from the title, I kind of expected it to be about generating all the content, um, like maybe Java Doc is almost, um, but it was more kind of enabling easy maintenance, wasn't it, as you say, sort of anything that might change. And that, I mean, that's a real problem because I've worked in technical writing and you just have to manually update everything typically. Yeah, and I think what's nice is if you, if, I mean, what, the nice thing about um, the way the way Webby works and the way um, the package I've put together works is that you can use any sort of templating language and that means you can put any variable into any location in your document. So, um, for instance, like, I mean, Webby happens to be written in Ruby, so you can run whatever code you want to beforehand and whatever's available to you in terms of calling the result of a function or what's stored in a variable can be put into any location in the document. Um, so it's, it is very useful as, as a form of um, software documentation. I mean, ironically, the one thing I haven't been able to do with it, and this is more the fault of uh, our doc is actually integrate automated Java doc style documentation. It's something I'd very much like to do um, and it's something I'll, I'll certainly look into. Um, but for me, what's very powerful is that you can write a generic template and using, at the moment I use um, Herb because that's the default in, in Webby and the default in Ruby, but in principle, any generic templating system and you can insert any, any function call or any variable into any point in your document. And that means if you want to write HTML and insert the results of a Python script, you can do that. If you want to write LaTeX and insert the results of a Ruby script, you can do that. And if you, you know, basically whatever combination you want to do, that's the flexibility of just working with open source and working with plain text is that you can just incorporate any data in any format into any document as long as the templating system supports that. You know. So in the, uh, one of the examples you gave, I think, was a uh, generating Excel documents and what the output of that was graphically. Um, so it would literally produce this, the screenshot based on running the generator that generated the Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that was a, that's, I have to say that is my favorite example. And it's um, basically what um, I, I ported a Python library for, gen, for creating uh, Excel, Excel spreadsheets. 
um, into Ruby and I was trying to work out how to write the documentation for that and basically in order to demonstrate the effect of the various formatting uh, commands, you know, you, with, it, with the nice thing about an Excel spreadsheet is you can really format the page to look exactly how you want. You have a lot of control and you have a very nice cell based system so you can really do a very, you know, a very nice tabular layout. Um, but obviously if you want to document that, um, you know, you need to be able to show a screenshot of the effect of, okay, if I call, you know, format and enter the text and then apply a bold and an 18 point font and, you know, what does that actually look like? Um, so the, the nice thing is because I have a very generic, um, you know, because uh, Webby is based on Rake, which is just a very generic uh, automation framework, you can you can incorporate pretty much any Ruby script you want, and that means you can you know incorporate pretty much anything you want. So I was able to work it out. Uh, Ruby has very good Apple Script integration. I was able to work out a really nice system where it would actually open Excel, open an Excel file which we had just created by running some commands in Surpass, and actually take the screenshot. And so the, the documentation was set up in such a way that you could um, just just basically run you know uh, run the code, generate an Excel file, create a screenshot, and work that into the document. And so the beauty of it is, if any part of that changes, if Excel changes, if the Ruby, if the if the function call changes, if any of it changes, you can update everything in one go. One of the other examples you gave was updating a PowerPoint presentation. Um, so, for example, if you have to do monthly statistics to present to your employer or something, um, I, I, I was interested, how, how do you actually do that? Do you actually edit the actual save file or do you actually somehow actually load that? And what, what, what tools can you actually do that with? Okay, well, um, the, the, that particular example was based on using um, a, a, a comm server called RCOM, which is the basis of RXL and a number of other tools. Um, it's just RCOM, and if you um, basically, there's a tool that's been built based on that called R2PPT. So it's R the number two PPT, and that will actually specifically integrate the R statistical framework uh, with PowerPoint. So if you um, have a script set up in R, which will generate some either some some numbers and some perhaps some graphs, uh, R two PPT will let you dynamically drive PowerPoint. Uh, to create slides and paste images and input data wherever you want. Um, it's, it's, um, so basically what that will do is let you dynamically update a framework. Now you will, you will I pre presume you will start with a template and insert information where you want or you could drive it from scratch and basically uh, Im import data where you want. So, so what are the, the primary data formats that you want to integrate with? Obviously Excel and PowerPoint for business things. Are, are there other formats? Are you talk about LaTeX as well. In terms of data or output? Uh, output. output. I mean, for me, like in a, in a business context, you pretty much are down to PDF and Excel uh, as a practical level. And if you need to give someone a printable static document, it's going to be PDF because that's just something that everyone can open and you know they won't be able to, you know, they don't need to, to mess with it or do anything strange. They can just print it out. And if you need to give somebody information that is um, that they want to play around with perhaps. Um, Excel is a fantastic framework uh, for, for giving people either either printable reports or things that they can play around with. PowerPoint would be, for someone, I would primarily envision PowerPoint being if people want to use it themselves. So if you want to automate your own workflow, um, PowerPoint is a great tool for that if, if that's something you have to use, if you have to make presentations, especially if you have to make the same pres presentation on a regular basis, it's a fantastic tool for that. Cool. So, are you looking for people to help out? Absolutely. Um, I mean, there's the the, the pro like some. I mean, Webby is a very uh, fairly mature framework at this stage. Um, obviously, uh, one of the things with Webby is I would love to see Webby ported into other languages because I think it's a fantastically written framework. It's by Tim Pease, and it's a it's a great framework. Um, I would love to see that in other languages. Um, my own the, the things I've developed are um, Gorgorella, which is a port of a Python library called Idiopide. Um and I've just started working on something called Dobby, which is basically um, it's kind of a it's a <laughs> there, yeah, that's a long story. Um, Dobby basically will take uh, an interpreted language and it will run it a line at a time and it will let you display the output of running those commands into your document. Um, you know, I mean, Gorgorella is, is fairly solid at this stage. Dobby is very, very early days. So certainly if anyone is interested in contributing, I'd be delighted to hear from them as far as porting to other languages or making it more solid. So where can they get in touch? Where they can they get in touch? Um, my own website is ananelson.com, A-N-A-N-E-L-S-O-N.com. You can certainly get in touch with me that way and find links to all the projects. Um, most of the projects, these are Ruby libraries, as it happens. They're available on Ruby Forge. So it's webby.rubyforge.org, uh, Gorgorella, G-O-R-G-Y-R-E-L-L-A, -L -L um, or Dobby, uh, all at Ruby Forge. Or, of course, you know, Google is the front end of everything. So. so you actually mentioned a whole bunch of tools there. Um, and you say on your website you link to a lot of different projects. Um, it, it, do you actually have documentation you've written or other people have written that actually ties that all together on how to do that? 
Uh, I, I, I don't. I mean, the best place to look at the moment is I've actually used this particular suite of packages um, to document t two libraries um, that I've developed. One is called Surpass, which is the Excel library we mentioned earlier. And Excel is uh, sorry, Surpass is a port of a, of a Python library called XLWT. So the Surpass documentation actually uses a lot of this functionality itself. Um, another one is BloombergAPI.com, which actually also uses a lot of this functionality. So because these processes are still in development, I've actually the best way to look at it at the moment is to look at this third-party documentation. And obviously, once it gets to the point where it's a little bit more stable, I'll be developing as documentation and possibly some screencasts of using the whole suite as kind of a, 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 a package for, for actually documenting every aspect of a project. Well, it's certainly something that's very in-depth. There's a lot to it. Um, and thank you for kind of compressing an hour-long talk into a, <laughs> a sort of a 15-minute info burst I guess <laughs> yeah, well, okay well, th well thanks for the opportunity and I think the best thing uh, obviously with, with, with all these is just um, you know if you can uh, look at the source of some of these things that's going to be the best way to learn it at this point because uh, it is you know it's still in development it's still early days I mean what I particularly like is the ability to have um, your website and maybe some PDF documentation and all this in just one package which is I mean the, and it's the flexibility of Webby that really lets you do all that uh, which is which is fantastic um, so I'm certainly you know building on some great tools out there um, and it's it's you know, it's it's very worthwhile for me to bring it all together, and I, you know, it's it's, it's great to make. I mean, this is primarily tools I built for myself to make my own life easier. Um, so I'd certainly be delighted if other people found that it made their lives easier yeah. as well. Excellent. Well, thank you for talking to us. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. It's time for the results from our competition that we had in two episodes ago. Competitions. Competitions from two episodes ago. Uh, there were two prizes, both books. One was the Drupal book, Front End Drupal, by Emma Jane Hogbin. And the second one was the Ubuntu Server Companion. Is that right? Nope. Oh, go on then. Correct me. Beginning of Ubuntu. Beginning of Ubuntu, sorry. Um, by Kia Thomas. Um, go on, Laura. What was the um, question and the winner of the Drupal book? Okay. The question was, what was the name of the episode of UUPC in which we interviewed Emma Jane Hogbin, who wrote the front front-end Drupal book? Okay. The answer was? The Waking Alley. Ah. Alley. I thought it's it was Alley. It's spelled Alley. <laughs> As in a passageway, yeah. you spell A L L E Y. Oh yeah. So, I think some, I have seen. I think I I've know. seen it written somewhere like that. Actually, one of the competitions. I don't know, Laura. Some people are so pedantic. Aren't I, they? Know. I don't know. I don't know. The Waking Ally. It still doesn't make a lot of sense, but I think yeah. it's. Am I allowed to say what the theme no. is? No. Um, anyway, so congratulations to Jan. Um, apparently, we owe you another competition prize. You won the voucher in earlier this season, and we haven't yet sent it to you. So we have poked the appropriate person <laughs> to uh, send the voucher off on email. And uh, Dave, what was the Ubuntu prize uh, question and answer? Who won? What was the name of the other book by Keir Thomas that we reviewed in the past episode? Okay, and the answer was? Ubuntu Kung Fu. Ah, yes, the tips and tricks book. Yeah, it was with uh, the kitten on the front. With the kitten. The yeah, it was. It was kitten. full of very quick little tips. Yeah, we moved that ages ago, didn't yeah. we? Yeah, it was back in season one, I think. So, who was the winner? Well, the winner was John Uphill, and he states he's a long-time listener, first-time competition enterer. Oh. That's pretty good going. Congratulations, John. Maybe you should enter every competition, and then you might just have more chance of winning things. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, actually, actually entrants do here. stand a really good chance of winning, actually, when they enter. Yeah, it depends on the that competition. Implies. Yeah, yeah you, you do have a higher chance of winning if you do if enter, you enter than yeah. if you don't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. a bit like the National Lottery. No, Always. no. <laughs> well, you stand a better chance of winning than, in, than the National Lottery, that's for sure. Though. <laughs> okay, well, congratulations to you two, and hope you enjoy your prizes. We'll get them in the post soon. As and soon as we can. <laughs> we have actually got a, a, another competition to start in this episode. We have an Ubuntu Ogio bag. Now, Peter Cannon won this bag and the raffle at og camp but very generously said that he didn't want it <laughs> uh, <laughs> because have he, it back. he's not exactly an ubuntu fan shall we say um and we can have it back to give away on this show so that's what we're going to do now so thank you to peter for letting us give it away and there is a question and the question is how many presenters were on the stage for the show of og camp yeah, the live the, show the live show we did yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. good question um, send your answers to competition at ubuntu-uk.org by the closing date, which is Thursday, the 19th of November. 
And obviously, uh, this, we're shipping this, so we just doing this one to Europe, are we? Or just yeah. the UK? Or? Euro, yeah, UK Europe and, and UK, UK yeah. isn't it? Yeah. 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 Sorry to everybody else, but, you know, it's quite a big bag. It's, I should say it's one of the Ubuntu lap, uh, Ogeo laptop bags. Yeah. Sort of... Um, Portrait style, yeah, not not a backpack rucksack style yeah. thing. It's a this, this, bag. this is one that was originally donated by Canonical, wasn't it? Yeah, you, you can see them on shop.canonical.com. So go and have a look, and then you see what the prize is like. They're really nice, actually, and well worth winning. It's time for the ecos for. Oh, hang on, wait, guys. Um, <laughs> Alan's not here, so we can call this whatever we like. Oh, now, geez. come on, Dave. You're the one who normally comes up with oh, the ridiculous no, no, names no, for this no, segment. No, no, no. I think we can point this one to Laura. Um, the bit about Ubuntu. The bit about the bit, you, bit oh, about I like that. That's what it's going for. I like. Okay, that. so welcome to the uh, bit about Ubuntu. I quite like that. It's quite good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, what's in the bit about Ubuntu this week? <laughs> <laughs> Lots of people with sound problems in Karmic. For once, not the fault of Pulse Audio. No. Yeah, it seems to be all sorts of ulcer related driver issues and, and things. I must admit, this uh, laptop here that we're recording on tonight. I tried to play a, a WAV file for Dave earlier this evening and it just didn't play anything from Totem using the internal laptop speakers. It worked under um, the previous release. I will file a bug shortly. I've only just done the upgrade. I he promise. promises. Alan will shout at me if I don't. Um, <laughs> but yes, yeah, so obviously are, there are some issues out there in terms of Launchpad bug, bugs and that's um, backed up with what I've found here, actually. One of the things I've been really pleased about in Karmic Audio is how well HDMI works. It really does just work out of the box. You know, oh, H- right, okay. HDMI is is the one where it's got video and audio in the same cable for like connected yes. to TV and things. Yeah. And it you know it really does just work out of the box whereas in previous releases you had to do some some magic to get that to work and it does just plug and work. So that's good. Cool. Now, this is an interesting thing. Um in a change from previous practices Ubuntu 10.4 sorry 10.04 will start out with a sync from Debian testing rather than Debian unstable. Um it's only for the LTS release this change. Um, although we're not sure whether it'll be for every LTS release, but certainly for the next one. Um, and it seems many developers, uh, developers were completely unaware of the change until someone spotted it uh, on the Ubuntu wiki. Um, so that's next April's release? Yes. Yeah. So rather than um, uh, Ubuntu normally, before, uh, just after the, the release, syncs with Debian Unstable, gets a load of new packages and things come in, throws out a load of patches, puts a load of new ones in. Um, but for the next release, they're going to be going with testing, which, as we were talking about, talking about earlier, actually, with the uh, the Debian structure, is the slightly older versions of the packages, but w- that have had more bugs squashed in them, I guess. So yeah. slightly more stable than unstable, but not as stable as stable. <laughs> yes. It, it, in some ways, it's actually making the lines between Ubuntu and Debian quite murky now, because it's you know it really is just a little bit above um, Debian uh, in so far as the actual getting stuff a little bit newer. And then the theme change. Well, it also depends on what point Debian is at in its release cycle as well, because if it's if it's gearing up for a release at, it could around be. that point, then it stops having extra stuff come into testing because yeah. testing eventually becomes stable. Yeah, and so we're essentially getting Debian, but with a with, with, with the a brown theme, with the brown theme, <laughs> and and the selected packages which are the default installed. Yeah. But yeah. as you never really know where Debian will be at any given release until you get closer to it. The, yeah, I mean they do they do publish vary. their publish their aims. I think it's just a really interesting change. Well, I can I think it's probably a good one actually. Was well, it something uh, I've always thought that Debian benefits from from Ubuntu, you know, importing so much from it is the fact that it's the unstable stuff, and we 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 do a lot of their QA and stuff, and then push mm. pu- push problems back to them. So we're actually helping the development release, and the fact that we're moving slightly forward means. Are we being as helpful to the Debian project as we once were? Probably not, but then an LTS release is a bit special anyway, isn't it? So I, I can see why you might be more cautious about yeah. about the sort of packages you're putting, pulling in. Uh, and hopefully it's not an indication that they don't think they can manage patching all the unstable packages to a stable yeah, state. making the unstable stable. Yeah, exactly. In six months. Yes. Mound Data Manager is a tool that can manage data in the context of other applications. You can take snapshots, delete, and move data from many of your favourite applications. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, that didn't make much sense to me. To what does it do? I think, and it's it's bizarre because today I actually said what we could do with is somewhere central that manages all the kind of settings and things for applications so that when you migrate to a different machine, you can just take them all to, with you without having to work through every bit of software and work out how to export its settings. That seems to be what this does. You see, I mean, we're starting to see that actually 
starting to take take fold now in some ways because uh, Ubuntu One is starting to do some of them things and sort of sharing, you know, with your Dropbox and, and, and all the other sort of things about moving files and moving settings. I mean, something people have traditionally done is use Dropbox and then had put all their things there, then, then simlinked. So basically had a shortcut to the files in there as well as syncing files. So, I mean, the actual aim of this, I'm... Uh, I'm wondering whether that, the, but how that works and whether it does it cleaner and sort of how it syncs. It, it seems to be an interesting project. Well, it looks like it sort of snapshots your dot file settings. And perhaps we should explain that on for those who don't know on Linux the settings for a lot of applications are held within your home area uh, in a directory that starts with a dot, so it doesn't show up in your usual file listings. So a dot file is is a hidden file essentially, and lots of applications will create a dot file like dot mozilla dot yeah. tombi and, and, and dot gcom yeah and hold the uh, settings for that particular application within that directory but they, there are quite a lot of them and they get difficult to manage what this seems to be able to do is take snapshots of particular settings for particular applications and allow you to roll back to, to other settings or, or have more than one profile oh. for a particular sort of application as well so you can have default settings and also some custom settings so if for example you wanted to have two f spot libraries under one user you could do that you know, so you could have you could use this application to switch to a different profile, and FSpot would load with a different set of settings for a different location. And the blog post about it, I'm just looking at, impl- um, says that it actually does the finding for you. So you you run mound, and it will find all the applications that it's able to manage, and then it'll take the snapshots. So it kind of gives you a list of what's available, rather than you having to go into each program and do anything. Yeah, there's a screenshot of the application and the applications it shows in the screenshot which presumably implies it works with them at least to some extent are chromium and firefox and tomboy and audacity and gedit and pitv um, and the uh, the transmission BitTorrent client also yeah so quite a lot of interesting and useful applications it's also got some applications there that i wouldn't have expected them to for the for be the first focus point, you know, like, like uh, did you say Ardor or or Audis- oh, Audacity? Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, that's quite a niche product that not many people really use. Um, so I'm surprised no. they've actually focused. On, you know, I mean, so, so if they're including that, they they must already have quite a lot they're supporting. Yeah, I mean, that was only a, a small snapshot, um, but it was like a really interesting project, and it would be great. It's almost like reversion uh, version control for. Your, your dot files, but with actually a friendly GUI quite a nice on the top, front quite end, a nice yeah. front end. Yeah. So is that actually in the archives yet, or is that... No, you're asking. Yeah, absolutely. This is a blog post. Um... It's available on Launchpad. Mm-hmm. I suspect there's probably a PPA for it. Hang on. Yeah, there's a PPA for it, so you can get it via that. So on... no doubt that'll be in Lucid, perhaps. Uh, fingers crossed, it looks quite interesting. And that's all in the bit about Ubuntu this time. Long-term listener Tobias Richter emailed in to compliment us. On a long flight, I recently had to endure some other podcasts. I usually don't find the time to follow many. And that made it clear again what superior quality you guys provide. That is both in audio quality and content. Sorry, can I just stop you there? Did he say superior or superhero? Superior. Oh, okay. okay. Why would he say superhero? I, I, I wasn't sure. Superhero quality. Maybe not about this episode. (laughs) Just referring to the show notes for your command line love makes it slightly pointless. I think you should spell the tips out and have the command and man pages linked in the show notes for reference and education. Or leave it out entirely. Well, the thing is, we don't want to be reading out echo 43 dollar pound sign plus greater than ampersand semicolon bracket curly bracket underscore fidget woodla boom boom blah yeah. i mean we, we we did actually discuss this didn't we i mean we, we actually did really think this through and we decided it might make it a bit dry and and, and also difficult to follow I mean, what do you do if you miss out a curly bracket you've got to go back again <laughs> and also who doesn't copy and paste to be fair everyone copies and pastes don't it's they? a bit of a pain if you're listening in the car yeah but you're not gonna be doing it whilst you're sat in the car are you you're not getting yeah, your laptop because, on the passenger well, seat and be, typing away are because you? that would really be relevant. dangerous wouldn't it <laughs> it's not really relevant to do it in the in the audio thing when most yeah. people listen in the car or whatever exactly hopefully we describe what the command does and, and maybe a couple of the commands it uses if they're not that common and uh, if people are interested to find out exactly how it works they can they can get it from the show notes however if our listeners strongly disagree then you know email in and we, we, yeah. we can change it. Yeah, and thanks for the nice compliments. Yeah, thank you, Dewey's. Mr. Bitfolk, Andy Smith, chipped into the debate on software snobbery and why we should learn commands as well as GUI tools. 
One day, IP tables functionality will change. Webmin or whatever won't keep up. Your firewall won't work and you'll have no idea whatsoever how to fix it. However, if you're using a distribution which will guarantee to keep IP tables and the management utility in sync, no idea if Ubuntu does, then fair play. I've also lost count of the number of VPSs I've had to re-image for people after they have installed third-party control panels that break when the underlying distribution changes. I think the best idea is for people to familiarise themselves with the admin tools that actually come with and are supported by their distribution. That's some interesting comments. I'm very guilty. I, I've read a book on IP tables. I, I did buy the book, but I've always used IPCOP to generate the rules and manage it for me or um, Firehole on servers to generate it from a config file because it's so much easier. Well, <sighs> that's it. I mean, IP tables is so difficult. No, no, hang on. IP tables has got a reputation for being difficult. And when you first look at it, it does appear to be difficult. But if you actually... <laughs> I'd say that probably makes it difficult. <laughs> well, no, no, no. Because if you actually do use a tool, like like, like Tony says... Then when you've actually got the rules there and actually look at the rules it's generated, you can actually see exactly what it's doing. And therefore, you know, that's a really good learning exercise to be able to reproduce what it's done. Yeah, it depends if you're interested in learning well, it. Well, yes, yes, this is true. I mean, now he does say he's not sure whether Ubuntu does or not. Ubuntu does. There's something called UFW, Uncomplicated Firewall. And it does make mm. it a lot easier because what you do is you essentially t- t- type UFW allow 22 or something. And then that will allow port 22 to be open. Okay. Yeah. Or, yeah, so you can have, you know, so I mean, that is a wrapper for IP tables and it works well. And because it's a, a Ubuntu um, application, it will always be synced with IP tables. So, mm. you know, I, I think we're okay in that respect. But, but yeah, it's, it's valid points. For me, the proliferation of all these tools means that there's probably some underlying problem that it's trying to address. But yeah. Stephen Fuller contacted us through the Hash Ubuntu UK podcast IRC channel to tell us about the new look he's setting up in the north of Scotland. You can find out more at www.nos-lug.org. Yeah, the IRC channel's got quite a few people in it these days. Yeah. It's actually Ubuntu-UK-podcast. Yes, yeah, because traditionally the only real lug in Scotland has been Glasgow one, hasn't it, I believe? Uh, there's, a, there's a Scott lug, which oh, yes, is the yes. whole of Scotland lug, but <laughs> Scotland's quite a big area. Yeah. It's quite a tricky for getting there on a Saturday. So if you're in the uh, the Outer Hebrides or somewhere and you're interested in having a lug that maybe is fractionally local, more local than some of the other ones, um, go along to the website and help out Stephen and get involved. Wonderful. We've had lots of feedback about OggCamp too. Yay. Mark Johnson wrote in to say that we did an awesome job with OggCamp. I thought it was an awesome day and the general atmosphere was perfect complement to the shenanigans of the previous day and night. I look forward to next year. Smiley face. Well, that's awesome. an awesome comment, Mark. Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was clearly bowled over with the awesomeness of the whole event. <laughs> Although I'm wondering if, uh, if things do come out of the woodwork about what happened the day and night before. For Mark Johnson, apparently. Mark did a very scary version of Delilah on the karaoke. That was worth seeing. Do we have that in audio? Uh, I don't, but I think it's on the internet somewhere. There's a yeah, it's quite frightening seeing all these geeks do karaoke. Yeah, I still like I still like to do geekyoki nights. I think I set up set up a tour in geekyoki where geeks come along. Who says geeks are introvert and reserved? Really, on some of the performances on there. Josh Holland, friend of the show, long-time listener, his version of um, the chef song from South Park was had to be seen to be believed. It was incredible. <laughs> was, was, was that um, Ubuntu Code of Compliance? It probably of- wasn't compliant, no. so I haven't gone into details <laughs> about that. We also had this Just a Moment from John, the nice guy, Spriggs. Hi, this is a quick and my first ever audio note from John the Nice Guy. Uh, I just wanted to thank all of those who made Lug Radio Live and Odd Camp reality this weekend. Without the support of the communities around three of the best podcasts in the world, we all would have been richer in pocket, but poorer in spirit. Uh, I also wanted to thank some specific people, John Owenak for torturing us all with the karaoke version of My Heart Will Go On that I'm currently uploading to YouTube, uh, Tim Dobson for giving me a project I hate so much, I'm glad I gave you so much free publicity and I hope you to buy me all my drinks at the Ubuntu release party in Manchester. Uh, to everyone who left me behind so you could all go after the Chinese restaurant whilst I was still talking to my wife, damn you all. Uh, but seriously, it really was an amazing weekend. I'm totally looking forward to what I assume will be called Og Camp 2010 featuring Lug Radio Live and Unleashed. See you all next year and uh, thanks again. Thanks for that. 
Sorry, Dave, go on. I was going to say, that, that was really quite good, actually. Yeah, yeah. thanks for that, John. It's a very, uh, very n- nice compliment. John was uh, one of the bigger personalities of the day with his outrage at Poke Book. Um, <laughs> and was, his funky T-shirt. And his funky T-shirts. He's got a strange... He was wearing a, a glittery Stormtrooper helmet T-shirt on the, uh, the the Saturday night. Yeah. It stood out a long way. But yes, thanks for the nice So compliment. is it true what they say? He is a nice guy? He seems like he a very, nice, very guy. nice guy, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, until you talk to him about Poke Book when he and goes he, not so nice. Yes. <laughs> Quite scary. Yeah, he goes a funny colour. <laughs> yeah. Michael and Rachel Hingley wrote a lovely long email with ideas and suggestions about the next odd camp, uh, including getting, getting people to do live just a moment and videoing all the talks. Um, now, the videoing thing has, has been suggested before, and basically, if there's anybody from the community, either the Linux Outlaws community or Ubuntu UK community or any other relevant community who'd like to step up to the plate and do it, then feel You're free. You're welcome to. You're quite welcome to video the talks and, and make them available, and we'll link to them from the website. Quite happy to do that. Um, but there's enough involved in the organising of the event to, uh, to we don't want to have to do all the videoing and stuff as well. Yeah, I mean, we've I think we've learnt a lot of lessons uh, doing this. This was obviously, you know, our first one our first time yeah yeah so so i mean now we've uh, sort of learned the lessons and you know and we have decided to run it again because it seemed to be have a we? success <laughs> I, I i thought <laughs> we had I, yes I, that, I don't think there's been any decision made well yeah i think we've, we've committed <laughs> to doing something next year we just don't yeah. know quite what shape yeah. it will have and so i think you know because it was a success last year i think we can probably put in more people to help out and you know we can see where it goes yeah, from there we know what we're taking on a bit better this time yeah basically we need people to step up and if they want to see new things there help us deliver them yeah, and, I and mean, the videoing is a classic case for that i mean one of the things we were concerned about was uh we did have a financial outlay and we were concerned that if not enough people didn't turn up that it wouldn't either make it worthwhile mm. or, or, or pay for itself so so now we've known there's a good attendance yeah then i, I think we can we're willing to have a bit more risk, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. There's lots of things to discuss about it. And any suggestions and things are, are welcome to the normal um, normal email address and any other means as well. And not only did Mike and Rachel write this lovely long email, but they wrote it that evening. It was yes. there by the time we got to the bar. <laughs> yes. Clearly a shorter journey home than we had. Yeah. We also had some uh, social network messages. Uh, Matt B 90 listened to the UUPC live podcast on the journey to work this morning and found myself laughing even though I'd been at the recording. Well, that's pretty good going. I'm not, mm-hmm. You know, I, I thought it was quite funny as well, chuckling yeah. away, but then I was kind of a bit more involved <laughs> directly. <laughs> Chemical Oliver had never listened to the recording of a raffle draw after it happened, but it's strangely entertaining. Yeah. <laughs> we wondered how that would work. Yeah, we did have a few comments saying it went on a bit long, and yes, it possibly It went on a bit longer in live as well, not just yes. on the recording, so you didn't lose anything there. Yeah. But, you know, well, you, we're, we're spreading the fun. Yeah. If you, <laughs> you listen to the, the recording, you got the, you got the same slightly too long raffle draw that you did <laughs> in the live event. And you just didn't get to see the prizes. Soren listened to the show from Old Camp and made his comment. What's this one distro stuff you people are talking about? Have you guys lost your marbles? People are free to do whatever they want in open source, and if hundreds of distros is what they really want, then that's what they do. If sound is broken, that can be fixed. All we really need to do is rally people and get them to work on it. You guys can help with that. Start a campaign or something. Talk to Canonical about it. Put it out there. Complaining about everyone doing their own thing is not going to solve it. Thank you, Soren. Uh, I think I think if you, if, if you want to start a campaign, we'll certainly pimp it and help in every way we can. Yeah, I, I, I think... The, the broader point that he's making is, you know, obviously there is some inherent freedoms in the way the free software works and we can't take that away and nobody's seriously trying to suggest that we should no. do. I think it's a good debate to be had though. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the whole one distro idea is so impractical it can never work, but it does underli- it does highlight the, the risks of spreading people and development skill and time too thin, really. It also highlights the facts of just not going to extremes. It's not about one distro or about zillions of distros, but... So just getting the point across that, as you say, you're spreading people too thin, maybe. I'm still amazed there wasn't a discussion of, is this the year of the Linux desktop? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> maybe we'll do that at our camp next year. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's penned in, isn't it? And that's all your feedback. Thank you. Thanks for listening and thanks to everyone who took part via Twitter and Identica. If you'd like to get hold of us, you can email the show via podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can leave us a voicemail in a number of ways, telephone 0845 508 1986 or VoIP us on podcast at, a, ah, podcast at sip.ubuntu-uk.org. Easy for you to say. And finally, Skype us at Ubuntu UK Podcast, all one word. 
You can send us your comments and get updates from recording sessions on Identica or Twitter, where we are at UUPC. Alternatively, if you're into IRC, you can chat to us by the hash Ubuntu dash UK dash podca- hey. <laughs> podcast channel. There's a lot of dashing going on it's there. A lot, it's a dashing yes. channel. I think I think we need a cup of tea for that. There's stuff happening in there too. Yes, yep. so so that is on Freenode and uh, on the IRC network. Yeah, join our Facebook fan page. Uh, find the Ubuntu UK podcast fan page on the Facebook fan page. <laughs> Find our Facebook fan page along with 300 other people. Search for Ubuntu UK Podcast. We welcome just a moment's command line loves, reviews, or rants, and feedbacks, both positive and negative. So please do get in touch. And thanks again to our community of network mirrors. <laughs> listed <laughs> on the website. Excellent. That's what I got laughed at for doing two episodes ago. So it's <laughs> great that somebody else has done it as well. Right, we'll be back in a couple of weeks with a whole different array of people probably. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.